Thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Nikki Jones, and um, I want to tell you why I decided to do this talk because most of my talks are just purely about energy. Um, I come. My background is in sort of development economics. That's the that's where I come from, from international development. And um, but I started writing about the politics and economics of oil and gas about six years ago, and it. I've always considered myself an environmentalist, so I've always been very passionate about it. And, uh, but it wasn't until about a year ago that I actually sat down and read the IPCC reports, the International Pla Panel on Climate Change. And I thought I understood it until I actually read them. And then I was so shocked, I really couldn't move for about 24 hours. Um, and I suddenly thought, well, why don't why don't people get this? Why haven't I got this? I thought I understood. And as I went to more meetings, I realised that actually an awful lot of people are sort of just a little bit confused about two degrees from what, um, you know, what are the greenhouse gases and so on. And so I thought I'd put this talk on the front of the ones about, that are specifically about energy, just because, just to sort of clarify some of the issues um, for people who perhaps would just like them all put together. I would recommend at any point that you... Um, see if you can read the introduction to any of the, um, the IPCC reports uh, and we'll, we'll look at some of the details of those as we go through. So, back to basics. So how old is the Earth? Does anyone know? Anyone have a guess? 6, years. How many? Okay. <laughs> four, for about four and a half billion plus about 300 million or so. Um, so here we have the last 5.3 million years and the top, top graph there. And that's, that's taken from NASA ice cores and, and sediment cores from uh, the global oceans all around the world. The bottom one is spread out. This is the last 800,000 years. So each one of these is the 100,000 years. And really, human civilization really got going around 10,000 years ago. It almost doesn't register on there. 10,000 years ago when we came out of the Ice Age and we had a fairly stable, um, stable climate. So we've had about 10,000 years of, of development as, as humans and uh, of our society. And what absolutely doesn't register on there is, of course, the last 250 years when we started to use fossil fuels. And um, so from about the mid-1700s, in fact, I think it was 1776, James Watt started the steam engine and we started burning coal and all the rest of it. And that's when things got moving. And what if we extended that graph or we enlarged it a lot more, what you would see is a pretty much vertical line at that point, showing what, what, what is happening to the temperature. So we've got this, this takes as the baseline, the peak of the Holocene period. That's, that's what the period is called now, or has been called. What we're now calling this last bit, where we have had such an impact on the world, the Anthropocene. And you've probably heard that term uh, mentioned. And of course, the point is, when we talk about two degrees, we're talking about two degrees from pre-industrial time. Um, and that's the crucial bit. And as you can see, we've almost not been there before. Um, when we have been there in fleetingly, our sea levels have been about four to six metres higher than they are now. So we, um, we're certainly into very, very new territory. Um, and of course, the big debate really is whether we can stay below two degrees or whether we go much higher. And uh, we'll come on to that. So here's, um, here's from, the, from one of the IPCC reports, just taking the figures from 1850 to, to 2012. And you can see the, the rate of increase there, um, obviously very marked. Uh, and if I put that, charted that against our use of carbon fuels, of fossil fuels, you'd see the absolute correlation. So our 10 hottest years have all been since 1998. And as you've probably heard, July was the hottest month, uh, hottest July we've ever had. And that was the last of 10 consecutive hottest months ever in our knowledge. OK, so we are we are heating up quite fast. I haven't heard the figures for for August this year, but I suspect that 2016 is going to register as a lot higher than 2015 at the rate that we're going. OK, so here's, this is from the IPCC report. And what you can see is that, um, of course, the level of warming is not even around the world. In fact, we even have a, a cooling 
uh, there around Greenland, which we'll come back to later. But you can see that it's very uneven. Northern areas uh, actually are, are heating much faster than most of the, the rest of the world. Um, but already some are registering at, at two degrees uh, or more of, of heating. A very good example is Iceland. Iceland is like a laboratory for us at the moment. It's been heating at about three times the global average for about the last 30 years. Effectively, Iceland has been dragged about 500 miles south. Um, and it really is a kind of portent of where we are to go. Um, there are some benefits. Iceland has lost a lot of its glaciers, it's got more land, it's got a longer growing season, it's actually able to cut down on its food imports, it's growing much more itself. It's fish, fishing different fish, the fish that it usually fished are, have moved on, but a new lot have come in. But of course what it has got is new bugs, new infestations, um, new diseases that they, they wouldn't normally have at that climate. And um, of course the, the big unknown is with Iceland's geothermal activity, taking that level, that weight of snow off that island is, has been likened to taking the lid off a pressure cooker. So whether we are going to see uh, consequences for this, we don't know, but, um, but it is one of the potentials. But anyway, for us, it's quite an interesting look at, at an exper uh, something that's likely to come to us. So the obvious question is, how do we know all this? Um, in fact, the central UK has the longest running data set of temperatures. We started recording them in the mid-1600s um, and very soon afterwards, or 100 years afterwards, we started um, collating our rainfall statistics and then sea level. And around that time, amateur scientists around the world started doing much the same. And we, of course, we have climate records through our trees, bedrocks, seas, um, the seabeds and rocks and so on. And of course now it's well monitored in climate stations all over the world and since 1979 we've had satellites to corroborate what we think is happening. When did we become concerned about climate change? Well we first noticed the greenhouse effect and I'll, I'll come back to explain that exactly but that was first noted in the 1820s um, and it's what actually keeps our planet livable. It makes it um, a, a livable temperature for us. Um, but the link between carbon emissions and rising surface temperatures was confirmed in the 1950s. And after that, scientists began to speak out very fast and very loudly, saying something has to be done. And quite interestingly, Mrs Thatcher, of course, who had a, um, a, a chemistry background herself, did say, we are seeing a vast amount of carbon dioxide reaching the atmosphere. The result is that change in future is likely to be more fundamental and more widespread than anything we've known hitherto. Unfortunately, she didn't do a lot about it, but there we go. One thing that was done was setting up the IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change. Um, and that was set up by the United Nations and the World Meteorological Association. And that has now become the, the overall global consensus of science. It draws on the work of thousands of scientists. And these aren't scientists who are just purely studying climate, they're studying trees, soil, marine culture, uh, uh, and so on. And it looks at all the, the peer reviews of those documents as well. So it's a very, very, very comprehensive um, body of work, several bodies of work. And it is, um, I mean, what many scientists would say, it is heavily, it's quite conservative, in fact. Um, in fact, I would suggest, if anybody would like to, the, the, one of our climate scientists, Kevin Anderson, is somebody I always recommend uh, watching. It's easy to find him on YouTube, and he is very direct, and he certainly seems to feel that um, the IPCC is, is quite a conservative body. But they, they, what is interesting is that they, they frame what they're saying about the climate. It's in, they grade it very carefully, making very clear whether they have high confidence or low confidence or medium confidence in a, in a prediction or a, a, or a statement. So let's just, so I'm going to run through a few rather dull uh, slides, but I think it's worth looking at the big questions and what the IPCC is actually saying. So first of all, is the world warming? Okay, so warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. The atmosphere and ocean have warmed and the amounts of snow and ice have diminished and sea levels have risen. Okay, so the world is warming. 
Is it caused by humans? Okay, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have led to concentrations of carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide that are unprecedented in at least the last 800,000 years. Their effects together with those of other anthropogenic drivers have been detected throughout the climate system and are extremely likely to have been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century, okay? So, what is it that we're doing to warm up the planet? Global increases in CO2 are due primarily to fossil fuel use, with land use change providing another significant uh, contribution. Okay, here we are. Look, this is just looking at our concentrations. So the green one, the green line here is CO2, the brown one in the middle is uh, methane, and the red one, reddish one at the bottom, is nitrous oxide. So you can see how that's not just rising, but it's escalating in its level of increase. <coughs> is global warming causing extreme weather now? It is very likely that human influence has contributed to the observed global scale changes in the frequency and intensity of daily temperatures, temperature extremes since the mid-20th century. Okay? So, yes, uh, it seems that uh, that is the cause of our weather now. Are sea levels rising? Yes, on average, around the world, they've ri risen about 20 centimetres. In fact, actually, if you look on the, at the Met Office, it's not even around the, the world um, Liverpool area, where we've had a station recording sea level rises for, for a couple of hundred years, I think. Um, it's around, it's more than 30 centimetres. Um, in fact, actually, I've just stuck this slide in because I just think this is an interesting fact. This is the Thames barrier, not a very good slide. It hasn't enlarged very well. And uh, it's just interesting to note that we are using the barrier more and more with each successive decade. This was actually finished in the 1980s. Um, but actually, of course, storm surge is the, is the biggest threat to London, as it is in Bristol. Um, but in fact, the reason that this is used more and more now is actually because of heavy, heavy rainfall. So in fact, what, I think this is quite interesting. What they're doing is um, when a heavy rainfall is predicted, using the barrage to keep the tide back to make London as empty as possible so that uh, London can absorb as much water as it possibly can. Um, so that's why it's being used more. Back to the IPCC. Are we le likely to see sudden changes? Um, and this is the, the big issue about whether, how long can we actually control this? When do we reach sort of uh, fundamental tipping points, as they're called, or feedback loops? Um, so magnitudes and rates of climate change associated with medium to high emission scenarios pose an increased risk of abrupt and irreversible regional scale change in the composition structure and functioning of our different ecosystems. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. And big question, is it too late? Do we all just hang up the towel, pour ourselves a gin and tonic and sit in the deck chair, you know, whatever it is? Um, limiting climate change would require substantial and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, which together with adaption can limit climate change risks. And we'll look a little bit later at the more specific um, scenarios that the IPCC puts, puts forward. But these do require substantial emission reductions over the next few decades and near zero emissions of CO2 by the end of the century. Okay. But the bad news is surface temperatures, temperature is expected to rise over the 21st century under all assessed emission scenarios. It is very likely that heat waves will occur more often and last longer and that extreme precip precipitation events will become more intense and more frequent. Okay. So there's a bit, it's in the pipeline with greenhouse gas, gas emissions are cumulative. There's a lot that we cannot escape now, whatever we do. And of course, you may say, well, what about all the other uh, climate and weather effects? El Nino, La Nina uh, are the most common ones. And of course, yes, they're all true. Um, it's a, this oscillation is two to seven years, but certainly um, the climate scientists have got that factored in. Let's just look at what the Met office says. Are we seeing climate change in the UK? Well, I've been telling my son for years that the summer's getting wetter and, uh, and it certainly looks like they are, a sort of 40% increase. And this is taking as a baseline 1961 to 1990, so we're not going back far for that. But we're talking qu about quite an increase in, in rainfall in summer 
uh, a more nuanced picture in, uh, in the winter months. And this uh, obviously is a picture from, this is from East Yorkshire, it could be from so many different parts of our country. Um, this won the Environmental Award in, uh, for Photography in 2011, I think. But, uh, but yes, we all are sort of aware of this uh, and that it, it's happening more and more, and this, of course. And if, if you look at the, uh, the Met Office uh, website, you'll see that they list between two and five ex really extreme or unusual weather events in the UK each year. And of course, actually, I've just slung this one in because I think it's so easy to forget. Do, who remembers? In June this year, the French authorities were having to evacuate art from the Louvre. You know, it's, uh, you know, gosh, when did that happen? And then it just went, it was in the news one day, as far as I know, and then out of the news. But that's a pretty major event. Paris was flooded. Okay, that was this year. Okay. Perhaps good news, we, like Iceland, get a longer growing season. In fact, um, we've, we're up about 20 days at the moment. We have, a, we have 20 days more growing per year than we did just 20, 30 years ago. And uh, so, uh, some of our thermal uh, growing seasons have actually started as early as the end of January, which is quite, quite extraordinary. OK, so just back to the basic science, just, just to make it really clear. What is the greenhouse effect? So the sun obviously puts down infrared uh, radiation. About half of it is absorbed into the earth and our oceans, and about half of it bounces back out. What we have is, of course, our atmosphere, and we have a layer of greenhouse gases that act like a blanket. And they stop, as you can see here, some of the, uh, some of the radiation going back out. It bounces it back down. This keeps our planet about 30 degrees warmer than it would be otherwise. Without the greenhouse, we'd be about minus 18 degrees and we wouldn't be living. There'd be almost no life on Earth. Certainly we wouldn't be around. So, so we actually need our greenhouse gases. But we've got a few too many of them. Um, but of course, they're not all as bad as each other, some worse than each other. So we have carbon dioxide is the main one, methane. Well, let me go through them, in fact. In fact, the, the, our most prolific uh, greenhouse gas is water vapour. Um, but it's, it's very unevenly distributed, it's, it, uh, you know, it's cleared very quickly with a rainfall or a snow, um, and it tends to be put to one side. But in fact, it is one of our feedback loops, because as we, as we uh, melt more ice and so on, we actually have more water vapour to, to deal with, um, and it is a greenhouse gas. It does keep our, our world warmer. CO2, the one we all know about, carbon dioxide, a long-lasting gas. So the, the emissions that we're dealing with now really have been around for at least 100 years. And that actually puts a lot of burden on us, or a lot of um, uh, responsibility on us. As a, a, one of the first industrialising countries, we, um, we, we put the emissions up there that we're dealing with now. Okay, so that's one of the issues for the developing countries who... Um, who sort of are pointing the finger at us and telling us that we're the ones who need to make the cuts. Methane, of course. Um, anybody seen uh, cowspiracy? Um, the big issue, of course, is whether methane is, uh, is a bigger issue, bigger question than, or a bigger problem for us than CO2. It's not really an either or. Methane certainly comes from animals, but it also comes from our use of fossil fuels. Natural gas, of course, is pretty much all methane. Um, and whenever we have gas pipes or we liquefy gas, transport it thousands of miles across the world, whenever we drill for gas, we have gas leaks, we have methane leaks. And methane has a global warming potential, as it's called, of about 25. So that makes it 25 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. Um, nitrous oxide, we are, obviously it comes from many different sources, from our power stations, from our transport. Um, people use it recreationally, of course, but I'm sure that's not such a big contributor. Other big thing is, of course, we use it on the land um, and it then floods back into the seas and so on. But this has a, a global warming potential of 298. That means it's 298 times as damaging as carbon dioxide. Ozone is a complicated picture. Um, many of you will know about the ozone hole, of course. The point is that ozone is naturally created around the equator and our winds take it up to the poles. 
where it sits in the upper stratosphere. That's where it should be, and that's where it does us a lot of good, because it blocks out the ultraviolet rays from the sun. And without those, of course, we'd have a lot more genetic damage, uh, we'd have a lot more cancers, so we need that ozone layer up in the upper stratosphere. And of course, when we started developing uh, freezers and um, fridges and uh, uh, squirty uh, aerosols with CFCs, we managed to put a whopping great hole in our ozone. And that's what um, was the, the big issue. If anybody remembers the Mo Montreal Protocol, all the states of the world did get together and they, uh, and they agreed to cut the use of CFCs. They are still being traded illegally around the world. Um, and we haven't done much about closing that hole, but at least we're not building new CFCs into our climate. Um, the problem is that ozone at ground level is, a, is a, a greenhouse gas. Our pollutions, our nitrous oxide and volatile uh, organic compounds, combined with heat and sunlight, uh, create smog and ground level ozone, which is highly polluting and highly toxic, and that is a, a greenhouse gas. So we got rid of the CFCs, and you can see here on the chart how we, um, we, uh, we cut our production of those. That was great, a wonderful achievement that the world got together, and we did that. Um, but what we did was we replaced them with HFCs and HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbines. And they, um, we have a program, we are supposed to be phasing those out in 20, 30, 40 years, but we don't have anything to replace them with, and we use them in many, many things. The trouble is that these have enormous global warming potential. Um, some of them, sulfur hexafluoride is the best known, I think has a global warming potential of around 24,000. The chemicals that we use for creating Teflon last for about, uh, have a global warming potential of about 15,000. So, um, they are enormous. The good news is they're a small part of our, our total greenhouse gases. Um, but the, uh, and in fact, the extraordinary thing is what a small part they are of our air in total. This is, I found this really quite uh, fascinating when I read this. I mean, carbon dioxide, our, side, our biggest greenhouse gas is 0.036% of our air. Methane, 0.00015. These are tiny, but any change in the balance has such an effect on our planet. It's quite, quite, quite extraordinary, I find. So you may have heard of the Keeling curve, and this Charles Keeling, who died in 2005, he was one of the first to start really monitoring our carbon dioxide. And of course, you'll often hear carbon dioxide measured as parts per million. And of course, when he started back in 1956, it was around 320 million. We're now, actually this year, I think in May, we peaked at 408. And we're, I think, on our fourth year of adding about two parts per million per year. 450 is considered commensurate with two degrees warming. So we, but what we've got here, you might wonder about the oscillation. That's the, the spring inhalation. So every spring, uh, our leaves come out, our trees come out, and they draw in carbon dioxide. And then come autumn, they let it out again, they drop their leaves, and the rate goes up. Okay. So that's what we, what we have there. Just, just to go back to the absolute basics, of course, we have always produced carbon, we've always produced methane from rotting vegetation, from animals, uh, from ourselves, and so on, and sent it up into the atmosphere. But there's always been a natural balance because it's been taken in by those leaves uh, and, and vegetation and so on. It's gone into our oceans, and over the very, very long run, of course, it's in the oceans, it's turned into sediments and then finally into rock over the millennia and so on. But we've had a very natural um, cycle. Um, if you're wondering what the figures are, these are gigatons, and a gigaton is uh, a billion tonnes of CO2. Okay, so of course that's the, the natural thing, but we've upset it with this. Um, so we've been, we've taken the stuff that has taken millennia, millennia, millennia to become fossil fuels, and within 250 years, we've just burnt it and shoved it up in the atmosphere very, very quickly, massive amounts. So that is, that is what has upset that natural cycle. 
And we're now at around, this, this is from the IPCC report, we're now putting up around 50 gigatons per year. And as I say, that's 50 billion tonnes, which is 50,000 million tonnes. And if anybody's looked at Tony Lovell, he's one of my, I find him quite interesting on, the, on YouTube, um, you'll see he likens it, he said, if we could see it, and it, was the, it is the equivalent of several airs rock. <laughs> you know, so if we, if we saw several big blocks of airs, big air, airs rocks going up into our uh, atmosphere and hovering over our cities, we'd be pretty worried. But of course, the trouble is we don't see it. Uh, and so we don't worry too much about it. Where does it all come from? Well, we know. It's as we've discussed. Afolu, by the way, is agriculture, forestry and other land use just if anybody was, anybody was wondering, but it's the, the, uh, the normal culprits of, of uh, an industrialised life. Um, actually, this one is the one that's often forgotten about. It's about 5% of our emissions, of our CO2 emissions, cement. Um, I've read, I find this actually a little bit hard to believe, but I'm told it's true. It's the second most commonly consumed um, product after water. Uh, I'm surprised, but there we go. Um, apparently, we, each person on the planet consumes about three tonnes of this a year. And obviously, we in the industrialised countries consume much more of it than most people. So that, that's, a, that's just a global average. But it comes from the whole uh, process of creating cement. Um, and we um, obviously very high consumption of energy just to produce that. But it's the chemical reaction from the heating of the limestone that releases so much CO2. But anyway, isn't it all in hand? We've got global agreements. We had Paris in December. Uh, surely we don't need to worry. <laughs> well, of course we do. Um, Paris was a huge achievement. World leaders, I think perhaps North Korea wasn't there. I don't know whether Syria was there. But almost every, every government leader was there, which was one hell of an achievement. This was what they call COP21, Convention of the Parties, 21. It was their 21st meeting. Um, Kyoto, the first, I think, was back in 97. Um, and of course, we were one of the countries that did sign up to that, but uh, uh, America and China did not, which put a big flaw in Kyoto. And we've had many since. Many of you remember Copenhagen, Durban, and all the rest. But anyway, Paris, everybody did get there, and there was an agreement that two degrees absolutely has to be the ceiling and many of the island nations um, pleaded and got an acknowledgement that we should limit it to 1.5 degrees if we possibly can. There is nothing safe about two degrees. The only reason we put it on two degrees is because we figure it's the, the level that we could possibly achieve, okay, if we pull out our fingers. Um, 1.5, as I think Angela Ledsom said about one week after she got back from Paris, well, that's purely aspirational. So, um, so there we go. And in fact, of course, this year we have seen some Pacific Islands, inhabited Pacific Islands, disappear. Big ones. I mean, big enough. You know, several kilometres. They have gone. So, um, back to the IPCC. These, the IPCC has come up with four what they call representative pa representative pathway, concentration pathways, um, to look at what we could possibly do. They've modelled our future. Now, the bad news is, of course, we're currently on that worst possible one. So we're looking at, by 2100, getting to somewhere between four and possibly six degrees warming. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, which is a very conservative body, it has no brief uh, from anybody, they are predicting six degrees at the rate we're going. And just to be clear, we do not live at that level. Humans do not live, nothing lives, okay? Um, human society is, the society we know is thought we would not survive really beyond three degrees, three to four degrees, not the societies that we know now. Let's be clear about that. Um, with all our, our modern infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, with, with our border controls, with our, um, with our health systems, with our pension systems, uh, it's very unlikely. So, but at the moment we are heading on the worst. It is possible that we could, with all uh, stops pulled out, mitigate that. We could, we could cut it, but, uh, but that, that's, that, that's what we're looking at at the moment. So here we are, worst, best case scenario and worst case scenario. 
Um, and you can see that worst case scenario, at the moment, we're looking at some parts of the world heating up 7, 8, 9, even 11 degrees. So, and you may say, OK, so, so come on, what's so bad about it? We're in Britain. We can, we can build the flood defences. We can, we can sort ourselves out. Um, well, this is, this is the example that's always uh, held up, of course, to, to show how one... How, how society could become very difficult. Summer 2003 is the one year I decided to go off to the other side of the world, the other hemisphere, so I missed it. But I'm told it was flipping hot. Does anyone remember it? Okay, of course, in France uh, and Northern Europe, there were about 30 to 35,000 excess deaths, deaths, about 2,000 of them in this country. Um, it was extremely hot for a fairly concentrated period of time. Um, and that, at the moment, is predicted to really become the norm by about 2040. Um, and by 2060, will be considered quite cool. So we're looking at enormous variations. In fact, Europe will be looking at sort of eight degree anomalies. So when we have a heat wave, it will be a phenomenal heat wave. Uh, for America, the prediction is 10 to 12 degrees anomalies. How do you survive? Um, and because, let's just think about it, this isn't just a case of staying inside with the air conditioning on. I mean, back in, with that, in that Paris one, uh, sorry, in the French one before, one of the interesting things is they had to turn off all their nuclear power plants because there wasn't enough cooling water. So, okay, you think about the impact on the infrastructure, on all our cables that uh, are, are overhead and underground, all our transport systems, our road systems, our trains. We work on a just-in-time food delivery, three days of food in any city at any time, the crop failures and so on. So it's not good. And I think, I hate to say it, but one of the things that I think perhaps should bring it home to us now is the issue about migration. You know, uh, it, we have a migration crisis now. And of course, much of the Syrian crisis is linked to a drought in that area. The whole war is linked to a drought in that area. It's just, I just think, it, I, I think it's worth adding into the mix of, um, of, of how difficult life is going to become uh, if we really have to deal with these temperatures. So at two degrees warming, some of the expected changes are, so the more than half our summers will be uh, at this level. Drought in many parts of the world, many low-lying countries go. Um, as Kevin Anderson says, and I, I do quote him a lot, um, there will be many, many, many people dead. Um, that, is, that is the truth of it. Um, more than a third of our species will face extinction. Of course, at the moment, we are in the middle of a mass extinction event. Uh, let's not uh, say that we're not. Um, and there is the risk of these large-scale irreversible events, reinforcing f feedback loops. So the IPCC puts it in a nice handy little graph. Um, so you can see unique threatened systems, yep. Uh, we're, we're there already, extreme weather events, we're there, um, likely to have an impact on things like pollination services, clean water, uh, and so on. And then, as we go on, the risk of large-scale singular events. So, I don't want to depress it. I will tell you, at the end of this, there is a little bit, I'm going to give you some little positives at the end, okay? So don't get, don't get too, too depressed, because, because it's important to remember, this is not what has to happen, it is what is likely at the moment, but it's what we have to do something about. But perhaps one of the worrying things is uh, these, these sort of tipping points that we face. So I'm just going to run through these quickly without trying to scare you too much. Um, obviously, as we, as we get hotter, the risk of those things happening increases exponentially. And you can put them into three major areas. There are some that I'm not going to cover, but the melting ice sheets, release of methane, or the possibility that our carbon sinks, our forests and woodlands, turned into actual emitters. OK, so first of all, melting ice. Um, and if you can, please do come and see the film Chasing Ice uh, when we screen it. But um, ice acts at the moment. It's something called the albedo effect, and it reflects uh, light back into, in, into the atmosphere um, and doesn't absorb it. The more ice we lose, and the more dark ocean we open up, the more we absorb heat. So that is a, a, a very worrying feedback loop. 
Um, and of course it's having, you remember right at the beginning we saw a cooling patch around Greenland. It's having a big impact on our Gulf Stream drift um, and our Atlantic Ocean currents. Um, that's been going on, the, the current has been slowing for around 100 years and certainly since 1970s it's been, the rate of slowing has been speeding up if you see what I mean. Um, I had never, until I started to write about climate change, I had never actually really considered the difference between our poles. Uh, and I'd never really thought about Antarctica. But Antarctica, of course, is a humongous continent covered by a humongous amount of snow. And this eastern side is fairly stable. If it should ever become unstable, we have about 70 metres of water rise, <laughs> so let's hope it stays stable. Um, but the western side is, uh, is an ice shelf, and much of the coastal area is an ice shelf. And, um, and that is now showing signs of, of instability. So that is, that is certainly a, a worry. That could, could raise our, our, um, our sea levels quite a lot. Greenland, of course, is our second biggest ice sheet. About 80% of Greenland is ice, and that is melting quite fast too. Um, it is predicted that we're in for about a metre rise in sea level from Greenland uh, by 2100. The interesting thing for, for me, uh, and maybe, maybe this is old news to you, is that the, of course the Arctic area is completely the opposite. Whereas we've got a big land mass on the South Pole, the North Pole is sea surrounded by land. So you can see here, can you see it? There's Russia, Korea, here's Alaska and America. This is all water in the middle with sea ice. And in the Arctic area, um, the sea ice is there all the year round, whereas it's not in the Antarctic area. Um, but of course it is melting. You will have heard that there's the possibility of opening up a shipping lane across the top of Russia, which many of our companies, our transport companies and oil companies are very, very happy about. Um, and it is very likely that at the rate we're going, we will melt uh, enough ice to do that by about 2050. So that, that will have a big impact. Glaciers, we have about, I think, 160,000 of these on every continent except, except Australia. And the, the rate at which they're retreating varies hugely. Um, they're not adding too much to our general water levels, but they are leading to uh, rock instability and they are reducing albedo effect. Um, so they certainly are an issue. The permafrost craters you may have heard of, these are, um, in fact, I'm going to go on to here so I can get the facts absolutely correct. Permafrost is ground that has been frozen for at least two years, but we've got an awful lot of it that's been frozen for at least 40,000 years. And in fact, again, I find this hard to believe, but about 25% of the Northern Hemisphere landmass is permafrost. And some of it, now that it's melting, it's turning to mud in Siberia and Alaska, you can actually pull out woolly mammoths from it. You know, they're frozen. You find, if you look on the internet, you'll see them pulling out tusks and God knows what. Um, but yes, we're seeing a massive um, uh, melting of the per permafrost. And the risk is, because it, it stores so much carbon, that we could release between, the estimate is 130 to 160 billion tonnes of carbon from that. And as I say, we've got these massive holes, some of them a kilometre wide, appearing. Uh, the metha methane clathrates or hydrates, we've got basically methane deposits around most of our continents uh, in, the, in the deep seabed. Um, or not so deep seabed, some of it, some of it fairly shallow. Um, and as our waters are warming, they're becoming less and less stable. So, of course, great news for the energy companies. Where the there are yellow dots, sorry, it's a rather grainy picture, but the, where there are yellow dots is where we're already mining these for fuel. In fact, we, we're already going for these for, for methane. Um, and the red ones are proposed. But the problem is, this is a methane plume underwater, and one methane plume, one massive one, could increase our uh, global temperature by about a degree in one fell swoop. So these are highly dangerous. You remember methane has a global warming potential of 25, uh, 25 times as bad as, um, as carbon dioxide. So, so there we go. And then there's our forests, of course, which are one of our, um, our carbon sinks are our oceans, our soil, and our forests. That's where we want to, well, we don't want to put 
more carbon into our oceans, but we certainly do want to store it in trees and vegetation, and we need carbon back in our soil, of course, our heavily depleted soils. Many of them need carbon back in them. Um, and here we are, this is boreal forest up in the Canadian uh, area. We're very, very reliant uh, in our country, for example, we only have I think about 10% forestry in this country. Um, we're very reliant on the boreal forest for soaking up our emissions. Um, but of course you can see large areas of deforestation there. We've taken it down. Um, we have new infestations moving around the world. This is bark beetle, which is decimating forests throughout North America. Um, and of course wildfires. I mean, I took this slide from a, from a, a public website in America uh, about a month ago just look at how many fires there are just in western in the western states i mean it's quite extraordinary and all of those were big enough to figure as a as a public threat okay so poor logging practice is another issue because if you just take the good the big enough trees and you leave all the rest they rot they they release carbon so uh, this is this is from indonesia where there's a lot of poor logging practice of course we shouldn't be taking the logs the trees down at all almost at the end of the really, really bad news. Black carbon, of course, we burn, burn stuff. We put out a soot. And soot is also, it's being distributed. If, again, if you see the film Chasing Ice, you'll see these pockets of black soot with, which are, are forming little craters in the ice all over Greenland, the Arctic, uh, and so on. And, uh, and this is, again, it's reducing our albedo effect. So it's, it's not one to be missed. Okay, so why aren't we feeling this more? Why, why, aren't, why, isn't it, um, why isn't it hitting us more? Of course, it's our oceans. And most of the heat that we've generated over the last 100 years or so has been going into the oceans. Um, and when you think about how it takes much more energy to heat water than it does to heat gas, and you think about, if you think again, I hadn't really thought about it until I looked at this. 71, 72% of our Earth's surface is ocean. It's quite an extraordinary amount. And that's an average of about four kilometres in depth. So about 30% of the heat we've been uh, putting into our oceans has been going into the deep ocean, which uh, is quite extraordinary. Most of it is in the surface, 700 metres, I think. Um, but the trouble is, is that the CO2 in seawater is turning to carbonic acid. You will have heard, no doubt, about our acidifying oceans. Um, dramatic drop uh, since 1990, bleaching our coral uh, everywhere, killing off our, our coral reefs and killing the, um, the little engines that, uh, that keep our ecosystem in, in the marine world going. Krill being, being a very good example of that. Okay. Enough. Okay, so really, so you know, it's just not not great, is it? We're um, we've faced with a massive challenge, and let me give you some positives. Okay, it is. It appears at the moment, and this is quite extraordinary if it's absolutely borne out, but that global emissions have actually plateaued for the last two years. So we have. If this, it would be wonderful to think that we have actually peaked global emissions. It is possible. Two years is too early to tell, but we're certainly not. We're, we're still bunging out 50 gigatons per year, but we're not increasing from there. Okay, so that's that's a little positive. Okay, I think there are positives in our changing world, and I'll go on to talk about this in subsequent talks um, to do with the world economy and how it's changing. It's interesting the talk now. You know, we we go through business cycles, we go through industrial cycles. But the big talk out there now is, is something quite fundamental, quite structural changing in our world economy? And that, that's a really interesting question. Talking about peak globalization, peak things, low growth, and so on. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, I think it's really interesting. You know, I read a lot about energy and, uh, and about renewable energy in particular. And it's just noticeable, the change. I mean, I read the, F the Financial Times every day for my sins um, because it's a good source of information. And you can see the change in the discussion and in the, the, what is in the, the articles over the last year or so. And the IEA, and I've now this year in their annual Outlook lecture, said that the Green Revolution is no longer a romantic dream. This is happening. Renewables are happening. 
Um, it's just a question of how fast. Now, we will decarbonise, but will we do it in time? The good news is, of course, um, and Tony Sieber is somebody that I think is worth looking up on, on YouTube, disruptive technologies. It seems to us that this is linear. We still haven't got electric cars. We still don't have smart, um, smart meters, for God's sake. We, you know, what's happening? The thing is that we know, in, the, in all our experience, is that these things go on an S-curve. Once they reach critical mass, they can move very, very fast. And that is what is predicted to happen here. There are various reasons why uh, we, in particular, in Europe, in the OECD countries, are at quite a critical point about choosing our path dependency. Most of our power stations are coming up for renewal. We really have big choices about how we replace these, whether we replace these with coal, gas, nuclear, um, or whether we, whether we go hell for leather for renewables. The trouble is we didn't invest in renewables in the 1990s when we should have, not much even in the 2000s. And we have left it too late, basically, to build us our way out of this problem. We are not going to, the bottom line is, we cannot rely on simply a substitution of fuel um, sources. This is not going to be enough to save us now. If we'd done it back in the 1990s, it might have been. It's too late now. We have to cut our consumption. Okay, there is no choice and as people in the uh, industrialised world actually that falls on us. Most of us are the, the world elite when it comes to consumption uh, and unfortunately that does arrive to us. But as, uh, and again I'll quote Kevin Anderson, as he makes the point, there are a lot of very simple things that we can do that make a lot of big difference. He points out the, uh, uh, very, uh, two very good examples double A rated fridges, because about a third of your consumption at home will be in your refrigeration. Um, so get the most efficient fridge you can, the double A. Uh, it's about 80% more efficient than an A rated, I believe. Um, and more efficient cars. If we simply, you know, we, these, are, these are bits of technology that we turn over very quickly. We tend to hang on to them for seven or eight years and then we buy a new one in built of obsolescence and so on. So there's the possibility that we can actually move onto a lower carbon uh, route very, very quickly. Um, but we have to choose to do it. And the question is whether we will choose to do it. And at the moment, there's no sign that we will choose. OK. Actually, well, I think one of the other interesting thing is, I mean, I haven't spent tonight looking at the, all what the, the climate sceptics have to say. I think it's the... Obama defense, which is no more time for flat earthers. I don't, you know, I have I've deliberately chosen not to rebut everything that a, a climate skeptic could put forward. But if anybody wants to look at skeptical science on the um, internet, I would recommend it. Um, you know, it's worth looking at just to, to see where the arguments lie. But what I am hearing more and more, so I'm seeing that the climate skeptic argument is really toned down at the moment. I think generally the argument has been won in Europe, if not in America. But what I am hearing from, from people is, oh, basically there's nothing we can do. Turning off your telephone charger won't help, ha, ha, ha. It's as if it's a binary choice. You either do nothing uh, or, or you do everything, and we can't do everything. That's not the choice. We all have choices. There are things that we can cut. Uh, and it, you know, it's time to do a bit more than turning off your phone charger uh, and so on. Two quotes from, from government scientific advisors, uh, both former, but, um, and of course David Mackay, who died tragically earlier this year. But as David King says, avoiding dangerous climate change is impossible. Dangerous climate change is already here. The question is, can we avoid catastrophic climate change? Okay. And David Mackay, if everyone does a little, we'll achieve only a little, okay? Just saying you do the recycling now isn't enough. You know, it's really, really a time to, to move. Um, so, of course, what have we got to do? Stop using fossil fuels. Uh, and we will look at that next week. And, and actually, one of the things that I'll be looking at in the future weeks is actually why this isn't... It's not such... It is a humongous challenge. It is a humongous challenge. I'm not going to deny that. But it, there are ways that it's not such a humongous challenge as it first appears. Okay. And of course, the other thing is we do have to build up our carbon sinks. We've got to actually get carbon out of the air, uh, positively out of the air, to go for negative emission growth. Okay. Or maybe we should just sit on that Titanic and rearrange the deck chairs. Okay. 
So there we are. I'm doing this for Solar Aid, but there we go. Thank you very much. And if anybody would like to, um, to contact me with any questions, uh, then please do. Or if you think of something after this evening, I'm very happy to, to hear. And I hope you'll make it to, to other talks too.